There were more serious complaints. Raymond Chandler, for one, took a dim view of the proliferation of guns toted by L.A.'s lowlife. As recorded in a 30s newsreel, all manner of firearms were openly for sale. Any strings attached to this? No. It's $38 and no questions asked. Good, I'll take it. Finally pressured to quell L.A.'s gun craze, Chief Davis seized an opportunity to improve his image. He confiscated hardware by the boatload. If there was a symbol of wide open L.A. in the 30s, it was the score of gambling ships anchored off Long Beach and Santa Monica. The Rex was the most famous. Water taxis took customers on a fast ride to just beyond the three mile limit, beyond the reach of the law. After an occasional pat down to make sure they weren't packing heat, they were free to give Dame Fortune a whirl. There was roulette, tango, craps, faro, and blackjack. <laughs> 3,000 people could gamble at a time. The action continued around the clock. Give me uh, $500 of the checks, please. All right, just put a marker up. Former rum runner Tony Cornero was the unofficial admiral of the gambling fleet. He was not a man to be crossed. Yet he confessed a soft spot for his customers. Tony didn't care for the word sucker. He preferred to call his clientele squirrels. Drab but cheerful little creatures looking for a little entertainment, a little excitement, a little wickedness. Tony's squirrels, the gambling ship Rex, and the Admiral himself. Tough, cocky, and not without charm. In fictionalized form, they achieved immortality in the final chapters of Farewell, My Lovely, perhaps Raymond Chandler's finest novel. In the first of many film versions, Dick Powell played Detective Philip Marlowe. I didn't see anything. I felt it. I was a toad on a wet rock. A snake was looking at the back of my neck. He's brave, moral, incorruptible. He never quits. Trouble is his business. caught the blackjack right behind my ear. A black pool opened up at my feet. I dived in. It had no bottom. Marlowe's nightmare. Pursued by an evil force, he's caught in a maze of crime and deceit. A mirror of Chandler's perception of Los Angeles. Regrettably, there was no listing for Philip Marlowe among L.A.'s real-life gumshoes. In Raymond Chandler's words, the typical L.A. detective was a sleazy little drudge, a strong-arm guy with no more personality than a blackjack. There was an exception, private investigator Harry Raymond. Newspaper man Jake Jacoby recalls. Harry Raymond was very resourceful, and I would say an excellent investigator and a good cop. He was a very flamboyant character. Uh, he certainly wasn't a shrinking violet. Uh, by the way, that was an expression from the old days. You don't hear it anymore. Uh, but that means, in effect, that he wasn't too much withdrawn. Well, his investigation techniques were not only thorough, but somewhat abrupt. 
I don't know if he'd fit it in my modern society, but he was sure right for his time. He didn't like crooks. In late 1937, Harry Raymond was about to get involved in the case of his career. He got a new client, Clifford Clinton, the owner of an exotically decorated downtown cafeteria. Clinton was good-hearted, so good-hearted that he let his customers pay what they could, or not at all. Clifford Clinton was also an active reformer. He didn't have to go far from his cafeteria to see that Los Angeles could use his help. But he needed facts, hard evidence of the city's corruption. He needed Harry Raymond. Back when he was a teenager, Clifford Clinton's son, Ed, helped out. Uh, Harry Raymond was asked by Dad to investigate many of these things and check them out, check out the sources, because here we were every night going on the radio. We would come on the air at 7 o'clock, I believe it was, and I would say, this is the people's voice. The cause is right, I know. And then I would begin to say, now, Father, we have a question here from a listener. How do you know that such and such was going on? Who wants to stand firm in the cause against years and years of the avalanche of abuse, ridicule, defamation, and physical harm that ensues from evil forces? And he mentioned names, and he mentioned addresses, and he mentioned incidents. I can only say at this time... As a result of the checking out of facts that Harry Raymond and others did, he was in a position to give highly specific information, no matter how high corruption led. We can stay united behind that cause, which is simply honest, efficient government. We can't lose. This wasn't exactly what certain highly placed people wanted to hear. And now our story becomes as complex, as seamy, as intense as a Raymond Chandler thriller. The newly re-elected mayor of Los Angeles, Frank L. Shaw. Fellow citizens, the confidence expressed in my public service by the people at the polls is extremely gratifying. To my mind, at least, in my opinion, he was a pompous ass. A man who knew City Hall all too well, reform attorney Grant Cooper. One could say that Frank Shaw, the mayor, was the figurehead. And his brother, Joe, did all the dirty work behind the scenes. At least that's the way it appeared to me. Joe Shaw was his brother's trusted executive secretary and the man who doled out the city contracts, the jobs, the favors. In the city hall in Los Angeles, you could buy a job. Uh, bribes were everyday affairs. It was a, it was a different city then. Than it is today. In late 1937, aware that Detective Harry Raymond was sniffing around City Hall, Joe Shaw got nervous. He was in touch with less than perfect police chief James Davis. In turn, Davis had under his command the final player in our real life drama, Earl Kynette, the shadowy head of the LA Police Intelligence Unit. On behalf of the Shaw administration, Kynette took it upon himself to cool down Clifford Clinton and his overly inquisitive detective, Harry Raymond, even if it meant playing rough 